So we're one, one hour past New York City, in the, right in the center of New Jersey, a um, town called Marlboro, 15 miles in from the ocean. So uh, about six months ago, uh, your pastor was in our church. He visit, uh, my, his dad is a retired pastor, you probably know, and used to be on staff with us. And he was off that week, so he came down and visited. And I looked at him, and I thought two things. Number one, I feel pressure. Eric is a, is a godly man. He's a man of God. He really is. But whenever there's a pastor in the, in the audience, um, I, I feel a little extra. But then, I, then it occurred to me, I said, man, I would love to have him speak in, in our church here in New Jersey sometime. And so we worked out this whole thing. We're swapping this week, but, but you get him back next week, okay? So, so that's a good thing. If you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Joshua chapter 20. Today I want to answer a question, why does the church exist? Why do we exist anyway? What is the church supposed to do and what are we supposed to be? A little while ago there was a study, bun, a study done by Barner or Gallup, one of these groups, and they asked people who went to church, why do you go to church? What is the church there for? And 80 to 90% of the people who answered said the same thing, their whole list of options. That is, the church is there to help me grow in Christ and to help my kids grow in Christ. That was the answer. Today, I want to suggest to you that that's a good answer, but a very incomplete answer, and maybe not even the best answer. I want to suggest to you, the church is here to help others, to be a city of refuge. If you're taking notes, write that down. Four words, a city of refuge. Joshua chapter 20. Then the Lord said to Joshua, tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as they instructed you through Moses so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into this, their city and pr- provide a place to live among them. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice. They are to stay in that city until they have stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who was serving at that time. Then they may go back to their own home in the town from which they fled. So they set apart Kadesh and Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, Sheshem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. East of the Jordan, on the other side from Jericho, They designated Bezer in the wilderness on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth and Gilead in the tribe of Gad, and Golan and Bashan in the tribe of Manasseh. Any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word. Bring it alive to us today. Thank you that you and the church are a city of refuge for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The church, I believe, is depicted here. This isn't just a depiction of cities in Israel, but it's a depiction also of the church and of Jesus. Let me tell you how justice worked in the day of Jesus. In the day of Jesus, there were no really standing police force per se. Um, So the way it worked, if someone did something really bad to you, hurt you, stole something from you, or even murdered you, your strongest male relatives and closest were supposed to do it back to them. It's called the law of retribution, an eye for an eye. Now you can see there are problems with this system a lot of people are going to be losing their eyes, right? If there's always revenge. And God is instituting the cities of refuge to break this chain of revenge 
But it says something to us interesting, that the church, the city of refuge, is for those who are fugitives. Do you know we're all fugitives? We've all broken God's law, and the avenger, which is the devil, has legal grounds against us. But I trust we have fled to Jesus today, amen? The Bible says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous flee to it and are safe. Probably most of us here did not come to Jesus while things were going fantastic in our life. Probably when you were making a million dollars a year on your job, you didn't say, boy, I need Jesus now. But I bet it happened when things weren't going well, when you'd gone through a difficult relationship. Maybe you were sick. Maybe you were struggling with a problem. The church is for fugitives, those who need help. A little while ago, one of my ushers came to me and said, Pastor, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem, Mike? He said, look at all these cigarette butts outside the door. What's wrong with these people dropping all these cigarette butts there? I said, Mike, would you rather they keep smoking and bring the cigarettes into the church instead of dropping? He said, no, no, that's not what I mean. Not what I mean. They're, they're, they're slobs, and what, what kind of people are we getting? And I said, Mike, that's what we want. The church is for fugitives. It's for those in need, those who need help. And he kind of got it. (laughs) Around that time, we had another incident happen in church, and this is pre-quarantine, the good old days. (laughs) Do you know how people have reserved seats in church? And some of you probably sit in the exact same seat every week, right? No? I see most people shaking their head yes. But in our church, in pre-quarantine, we have a matriarch of the church sitting right about there in the middle, where that sister in white, white is, right there. And she sits there, and then she's surrounded by two of her children who have their own children, and it's, it's the Sister Roz section. Well, one thing happened one day. Someone new came in church and sat right in her chair. It was a crisis. Her kids looked at him like, sitting in our mother's chair. And then Roz herself walked in and looked at her and said to herself, they're sitting in my chair. Doesn't everybody know this is my chair? And then she told me afterwards, she said, wait a second, I caught myself. I said, this is good that there's someone new in the church who's sitting in my chair. They could not be a Christian, they're here for the first time, they could be seeking Jesus. It was good they were there. And also, maybe God spoke to her and said, if you were right on time, they wouldn't have stolen your seat. But that's another issue, we won't go there today. The church exists for people in need. It's a city of refuge. I wanna show you a picture. Do you know there's a real city of refuge in America? You need to go there. It is in a place where it never snows. I was so shocked. I'm from New Jersey. I'm not used to New England weather. When it started snowing this morning, I was like, are we in a different country? <laughs> but this is, oops, go back to that. Get rid of it. This is the picture. This, this is in Hawaii. Wouldn't you like to be in Hawaii right now? My wife and I, on her 25th anniversary, went to Hawaii and there's, that is translated City of Refuge National Historic Park. It's a real place. I had no idea. On the Big Island, if you ever go there near Kona. And it is such a cool spot because the way it worked in the 15th, 16th centuries and onwards, they had all kinds of taboos on the island. This is before Christianity. And if you did something something bad, something bad means if you walked and the chief's shadow touched you. If you were walking and you stepped in the chief's steps, you had broken a taboo, a capoo they called them, 
And the gods would be mad at you and could do the worst thing possible, send an eruption of the volcano, which in Hawaii has been catastrophic. So if you broke one of the taboos, you were subject to death. Imagine that. But if you could get to this place, and these, these are some benches and a table right at the city of refuge. If you could get there before the king's servants came to kill you, you would be safe. You, could, you would stay there typically, we were told, a week, maybe 10 days, and the priest would do his thing, and then you would be released back into society, forgiven and safe. City of Refuge National Park. Let me tell you something about the City of Refuge, though. It's only safe if you're inside the walls. You can't be outside the walls. We'll show the, the, other, the picture. next picture, please. Let me tell you how this would work. Imagine you were working one day, you're in construction, and you accidentally push a cart, and you didn't know that your partner's behind it, and it, 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 it goes rolling, and it hits him on the head, and he dies. And you're horrified. But then you say to yourself, oh, no. My buddy always told me he's got two brothers, and one is in organized crime. And they are, in that day, the, the brothers were obligated to kill the person who'd taken out their brother. That's just the way it worked you would be in a panic. And I, I, I'd run home and say, Louise, I killed someone at work. I need my sneakers right away and water. I gotta get to the city of refuge. Help me quick, I'm panicked, Louise. Louise, you know, my partner's brother is, an, is, is a runner. He jogs all the time. Do I have enough time to tie the shoelaces even? Just help me, help me get there. <laughs> It's 10 miles. How, I haven't run 10 miles for years. These guys are younger than I am. I'm toast. I'm a dead, dead meat. I think, give me some water. 10 miles. So you start running. <laughs> nice knowing, yeah? <laughs> yeah, thank you. So you start running. I run five miles. I'm about to collapse. But then I look, and so I'm walking. I walk another mile or two. But then I look back on the horizon. I see a cloud of dust. You know what that is? That's my partner's brothers coming for me. They're gonna kill me. And then I realize I think I can run a little bit more. I think I have it. But then I get a mile to the place and they have almost totally caught up with me. There's five of them. There's two brothers. There's cousins and some friends, and I don't know who, but I can tell you I'm outnumbered. I can see they have swords in their hands, all of them. They have spears. I'm tr in trouble. I, ru I, I start running more. I get within 100 feet of the city. The gate is open. The guard is there. The watchmen are, I look up and I can hear them talking. They're making bets on whether or not I'm going to make it. The one guy says, he's not going to make it. The other guys are younger and faster. And the other, and, and, but the other guy says, he might make it. He had a good lead. We'll see. But I get to 100 feet away, and his brother throws a spear at me, hits me, goes right through my ear. My ear is bleeding. I suddenly realize I can run a lot faster than I ever did before. I get, and I run, and I get to the gate 10 feet ahead of those who are chasing me. And I, there I am. I looked a lot younger then. And then you say three words to the guard at the gate. You know what those are? I request refuge. Those are the magic words. And from that moment on, I am under the protection of the city. The man at the, at the gate, backed up by the entire city, says, no, you can't touch him as long as he is here. He is protected as long as he is, stays within these gates. Friend, I trust that you fled to Jesus for the protection of your sins. I trust that you're within the walls of the city, that your sins are forgiven, that the avenger, the enemy, the devil, 
who has a legal claim on us. Jesus has canceled that out by taking us into the city. I have a relative who we've talked to for, for many years and said, you need Jesus. And this relative says, I'm not ready yet. And I say to myself, whenever they say I say, you're living dangerously. You don't know when yet is. You're outside the walls. Do you know you could run 10, 20 miles to the city, but if you weren't in the city, your enemy could pick you off. Number three, you had to stay in the city or you could forfeit your life. Look what Numbers says, and if you want to read more about this, Numbers 35 has a much longer treatment of it. But if the accused ever goes outside the limits of the city of refuge to where they fled and the avenger of blood finds them outside the city, the avenger of blood may kill the accused without being guilty of murder. It was not uncommon in the day of Jesus and before for relatives of the person who had died to hide outside the city, to set up a tent somewhere and to say, we're gonna stay here and in case he goes out of the city, we're gonna be ready and we're going to take him out. Do you know there's protection in the city? Do you know there's protection in the church? I am so glad you're here in person today because it says to me that you appreciate the church. The church provides support. It provides prayer. It provides covering. It provides accountability. As a pastor today, I see many of my people, and this is in New Jersey. I'm sure this doesn't happen here. But who've drifted. Who, during the quarantine, we couldn't meet for, what, 10 weeks or something like that. And then people came back, but some people didn't come back, and some people have never come back. And it, it's not like they have a major health problem or they're elderly or something. They just kind of got lazy and have drifted and drifted. And a couple of them are outside the city right now. A couple of them are like, I don't know if I believe anymore. I don't know where I'm standing. There was a lady who used to come to our church sporadically, but she came. And we interacted with her this week, and she said, you know, I haven't been back she said, my two girls aren't real interested anymore in serving Jesus. They don't really want to come with me when I come back. God bless you for being here. Those online, I want to say to you, if there's any way you can physically get here in person, it's important because the church provides protection. It's a city of refuge, but you got to be in it. Number four, the church... It's like a city of refuge. You need to have one near everybody. Let me explain that. If we look at this map, we can see here that here's a map of, of Israel and the cities of refuge on it. We're pulling that map up. And you can see, do we have the map? You, anyway, if you see the map, you would see that <laughs> that is such an incredible map, it just shorted everything out. <laughs> but that's okay you would see that oh, the six cities are divided up among Israel so that, there it is, no person was further than 50 miles from one. So that if you had had an accident and were being pursued by the avenger, you could get there in a day or at the most two, and there were no mountains or rivers between them. Do you know church? This is why we need to have churches all across America and across Connecticut. We need to have them so that people who need help can find help and find it easily and close by. This is why we started our church years ago, because we were in an area that was growing quickly, was definitely under-churched, where there weren't a lot of options. It's a city of refuge. This is why we support missionaries, and I think it's wonderful that you gave all that money to help in Haiti. I've been in Haiti three times but we support missionaries so they can start churches so people in need can find help everywhere. The church is a city of refuge. Number five, the church and the city of refuge needs to be visible to everybody. Here's a picture of what the, what 
a city set on a hill. And Jesus talked about that, right? A city on a hill is not easily hidden. And notice that that they say that the cities of refuge, they were always built on a mountaintop. They were made of limestone. They gleamed white in the day. And even at night, you could see them from miles away. So that if you were running to them, you would be able to get there. You'd know how to go. There were signs to the cities. We'll show a typical sign. There were signs for miles around like this, but they weren't written in English. They were written in Hebrew. And there were signs, refuge, because if you were running and being chased by the avenger, you didn't want to make a wrong turn. Your life depended on it. Do you know that they actually had work days, we're told, by historians? Because the people in the city of refuge knew that they lived in a special, a unique city. Their job was to make it accessible. So what they would do, they would go out after the winter and other times during the year to clean up all the roads nearby, clean up the brush, remove obstructions, make it easy for people to get there. They would fix the signs so that everybody knew where the city of refuge is. That's my prayer for your church, too. That everybody throughout Cheshire, everybody throughout this part of Connecticut knows this is a place where people can come and get help. This is a place where people can get restored. This is a place where people may have messed up their life totally, but God can redeem and restore them. I am so excited about what we're doing next week I am praying so hard for good weather next week. Do you know why? Last year we tried something. We tried a nativity drive through We'd always wanted to do this for years. Um, Our parking lot is laid out perfectly. It's got islands, and just the way it's laid out, it would be good. And we said, let's do something. You know, last year was such a depressing year, and we were quarantined and separated, and, and we can just have people in their cars drive around, and we had... Uh, nine scenes from the Bible and actors all dressed up and pretty nice scenes and animals. We had even had alpacas. And I even never, we even had zebus. I had to look up what a zebu was on Google. Do you know what a zebu is? I didn't either. But anyway, last year we did this and we said, let's do this. This will be a way to let people know that there's a place they can come to for help. And we didn't know what to expect. I said, it, it's an experiment. If it goes well, we do it again. If it bombs, we say we tried something. You know, we had over a 1,000 people come. I was stunned. People drive through, and it was a great opportunity to tell people, there's a place you can come. There's a city of refuge here and receive help. Number six, the cities are open to everyone all the time. One thing that was unique about the city of refuge was that most cities in that day cl- and here, closed their gates. And here's a typical city. This is Jerusalem, the, uh, I believe it's the Damascus Gate. And most cities would close their gate. But this is a great place, by the way. You gotta go to Israel someday. It should be on everybody, everybody's bucket list. It's an incredible thing to do. But most cities would close their gates when, it, when the sun went down, Open them up when the sun rose. But the city of refuge never closed its gates. They always had their gates open because you never knew when someone would come running asking for refuge, even in the middle of the night, being pursued. So they had guards and all kinds of people. The gates were always open for everyone. Church, the church is for everyone. When we started the church, I was a young, young guy with more hair and with little kids, two little kids, three and a couple months old, a baby. And that's what we attracted. We had other people. And then we said, you know, something is missing. We're missing old people, which we defined as people over 50. And we're missing teenagers. We need to take steps to bring them in. And we did, and we prayed, and God brought them in. Do you know teenagers eat a lot? Hadn't thought about that. But then one day as the church started growing, 
God started impressing on me something. And I hope you don't mind my sharing. God started impressing me. You know, the church is all white. There's other people in this community who aren't white. And we started praying and taking some actions. And one day, a black family showed up and said, this is where we're going to stay, and we are going to reach out and make this a place for black families in the community. To the point today, where the church is about one-third Islander, African-American, and African uh, Im recent immigrants. God has brought those people. We started noticing, too, that Spanish people were moving in, especially one town uh, next to Marlboro, a huge Mexican population developed. And we started reaching out to them, and God brought someone who could reach them. And today we have a Spanish service at 1 o'clock. As a matter of fact, you can pray for Pastor Eric because he's preaching at it. <laughs> and I said to him when we talked a couple weeks ago, we talked a couple times, but I said, Eric, do you speak any Spanish? And he was like, well, not really, not really. I know a few words. I know some food, I, you know. <laughs> he said, but, you know, my wife speaks it, and so his wife is going to translate him. You can ask him how that went. Pray for him. That's in about half an hour. Half an hour. Recently, we, we started looking around and we realized that there are a huge number of people from Asia moving into our area because we have strong schools. A lot of Chinese people and Indian especially. God bless my wife, my wife Louise. By the way, she has a brother who is a pastor in Connecticut named Charlie Brown. True story, I kid you not. About an hour east of here. We're going to see him later. I'm not joking. But my wife leads a Bible study for Chinese women now, which is a great outreach. They get together once a month, study scripture, talk, fellowship, and you'll never guess what they eat. Chinese food. And they always invite me in, Pastor Rich. I love them. My wife leads a, a Bible study once a month for Indian people, people from an Indian background. And do you know one of the most faithful people in this? I w please pray for her. Her name is Tina. And she, um, how would I describe her? She respects Jesus, believes in Jesus, but uh, I don't think, she, she, she doesn't recognize Jesus as the only way to God is the best way to describe it at this point. She still believes in a lot of other stuff as well. But she is so close, and she comes all the time. You know, she's gone through a difficult time in her life. She just got a divorce, just moved, all this kind of stuff. That's what the church is about, isn't it? It's a city of refuge for people. And you know, when people came to the cities of refuge, in biblical times, they... The city, of, they would just come with what was on their back because they had to get out and get out there fast to make it. So the city would stockpile all kinds of clothes and food for them, supplies when they came, so that they could stay there. They had uh, uh, lodgings, especially for people who had, who had sought refuge. Do you know that's kind of what the church does, right? When people come in, you have a thing called growth track, right? To help people grow. You have life groups, Bible studies, prayer meetings, because the goal is to help us become more like Jesus. How does all this end? You'll notice one thing I think is really cool in this story. You'll notice that the fugitive could, had to stay in the city but was safe as long as they didn't leave until the high priest died. Did you see that? Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a fugitive in that day, and I got in and they accepted me. You know what my first question would be? How old is the high priest? And what kind of health is he in? Well, tell, tell me about the high priest. And you would hope and say, boy, I hope this guy is really old and I don't wish him ill. But do you know when you get news, you know, the high priest is really sick, I'd say, I'm packing my bags, buddy. Because the second the high priest dies, I am out, released into society again. And in the day of Jesus and before, when, when the high priest died, 
That person who went out, they were considered a special person. They were considered a person who had been shown special mercy because they had been under a sentence of death but had been released from the sentence and now could return to normal life. Doesn't that sound a lot like us as believers, friends? We have sinned. The avenger of blood had a legal claim up against us, but we fled to the city of refuge, to, the, the, to Jesus, to the church. We were restored, we're forgiven, we're released, and we go back to help others, to help others. The church is a city of refuge. My prayer today for all of us, for you, for me, for this church, for my church, is that this will be a place of refuge. That people driving down the highway will say, you know, I see that church. I've heard good things about it. I'm going through some challenges in my life. I have a health challenge I'm worried about. The doctor says I need special tests. Maybe I should go and get and just see what it's like once. It's a city of refuge. Stand up with me in closing, please. The church is a city of refuge. That's why I believe God's devoted three cha- most of three chapters in the Bible to this. It's a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of the church. Let's pray. God, we thank you today. God, that we're, we're recipients of grace and mercy, God, and we're grateful for that today. God, you've been so good to us, God. God, even though the enemy had a legal claim against us because of our sins, God, we fled to Jesus. We fled to the city of refuge, God. And God, we're grateful that you received us, God, and you protected us and canceled out the claims of the enemy against us. And God restored us, God, and the enemy can't touch us now. God, we're just so grateful for that today. Thank you for Jesus, God. Thank you for the church. Thank you for loving brothers and sisters who help restore us today. God, we're grateful for this. I want to ask, ask if you're here today, and I've never been here before, so I don't know any of you, but I want to ask if you're sure that you're in the city of refuge. You're sure you're in Jesus. You know that if you were to die today, and one of us, one day all of us will die, some sooner, some later, but you know you go to heaven. You can be sure. You need to know that you're inside that city, that your sins are taken away. And you can know. You can be sure. If you want to do that, just while every head's bowed, every eye closed, just raise your hand up high. Raise your hand up high. You're not sure your sins are taken away, but you want to know that they're taken away. Thank you. Thank you. Others, thank you. We're going to pray. Thank you. Thank you. All over. Thank you, God. God, we just thank you for this today. And online, if you're watching with us, please please pray with us. Just pray this prayer with me. God, I admit I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. Please forgive me. I believe Jesus died for me. Give me eternal life. I receive your forgiveness. I thank you now that I'm in the place of refuge. I've run to you, and I'm safe. Thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you did that today, please please talk to Pastor Rich or one of the other leaders. If you're online, you did that. Please let, let the church know. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that so much. What a beautiful picture of the gospel, right? Uh, running for our lives, you know, feel like death is chasing us down and you arrive at the city of refuge and say, I request refuge, right? And if you prayed that prayer and maybe you feel that way, you know, my life's been a mess and I'm just running and, and today you just came to Jesus and said, I'm requesting refuge. Jesus, receive me, forgive me, take me in, make me your son, your daughter, forgive me of my sins, uh, he, he accepted you. He opened the gate. He took you in. And now you're a part of his family, part of his people, automatically. Now you're a son. You're a daughter. You know, he makes you, uh, right? Now you're a, you're a prince or a princess, right? A uh, king's kid. And, and uh, no 
greater moment uh, than that when you surrender your life uh, to Christ. And so if you did that, again, as Pastor mentioned, let us know, please. Uh, we want to help you uh, and walk with you and journey with you. We're all on a journey. We're all walking with Christ. Some of us are a little further down the road. But we're trying to do this thing together, walk together and live for Christ and, and learn Scripture together and learn how to pray together and learn how to, again, walk with Jesus and, and live out that salvation that he gives so freely, right? And so we would love to have you be a part of that by joining a small group or whatever it is. So let us know. If you're online, just use our website. There's a connection card there you can fill out, a place where you can indicate that you gave your life to Christ. If you're here today, uh, you can use a communication card that's in the seat in front of you. You can text that information to us. I think there'll be a number there somewhere uh, for you to do that. You can come and let me know personally. Again, we just want to help you in whatever way uh, that we can walk in your, your relationship with Christ. Just beginning. And now it's time to just go from here and all the good things that God has uh, for you. We want to worship the Lord with our uh, tithes and offerings and missions giving this morning. You know, many of you are familiar with all of the ways that you can give here at Cornerstone. You can use our Push Pay app. Go right to Push Pay and then Cornerstone Cheshire. Uh, you can give that way. You can give online at cornerstonecheshire.com. There's a link that you can uh, give there. Uh, you can use an envelope that's in front of you in the seat back uh, and put your giving in there. And then there are offering boxes located near each of the exits, some out in the foyer there. You can place those in there, and uh, we'll get it. If you want to mail it in, you can do that too. Uh, um, all of those ways and more. And all of that is worship. All of this is a way that we worship God with our, our giving to say thank you for all of the good things that he has done. And uh, we're so grateful for your faithfulness in giving because it allows us to bring the gospel to so many places. Uh, bring refuge to people who need it, places like, like Haiti. And you heard that uh, previously. So thank you for your faithfulness. And we appreciate it so very, very much. I want to pray with you and for you. Uh, before I do that, I should mention Growth Track today, 1 o'clock, right after the service here. We have lunch provided. Uh, step four today. So for those of you who are completing that process, congratulations. Love to have you there. Uh, you can join and start today if you like. Uh, feel free to join us again at 1 o'clock in the conference room uh, out there. So let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you today. Thank you for just a wonderful time in your presence, Lord, and being able to worship you and uh, Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our hearts, in our lives, and helping us to become a church, a place of refuge for so many. Continue that work in us. And Lord, continue your work even as we come to the altar to pray at the end of the service, Lord, and seek you and just let you continue to do what you do in changing and transforming lives and making uh, beauty from ashes, Lord. Uh, thank you for that. Lord, and as we give this morning, we do so joyfully and as an act of worship to you, for all that you have done, all that you give to us, Lord, it's our delight and joy to give back to you. And Lord, we lay it at your feet. We say, take it and use it to advance the good news around the world. And now, Lord, as we go, I just pray, Lord, your blessing on your people. I pray peace, peace within them, peace within their homes. Lord, peace in their neighborhoods and workplaces. And uh, Lord, may you bring that peace to them, through them, uh, into the world for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you.